All right, welcome to the uh, to this webinar about message routing and Axon Server. Uh, a few uh, weeks ago, by now, um, there was a somewhat related webinar about uh, event storage. Uh, so, if you're uh, interested in seeing more details of that, you can uh, you can check out the uh, the recording of that webinar. This time, we're going to focus more on the uh, the messaging itself and how does Axon Server help. Uh, uh, messages get from one uh, from their origin to their destination in, in, in Axon Server. So by now, uh, I've said this uh, quite a lot of times, but um, the Axon Server is a component that together with Axon Framework helps create um, an environment where applications can communicate with each other or components within applications can communicate with each other regardless of their, uh, of their location. So in this uh, this example diagram, there's an Axon server sitting between in between two uh, two application instances. Each application instance will uh, will have Axon server embedded in uh, inside of it. And if we decide to migrate from two services to a third one, uh, uh, or or split a certain service into two. Um, we can do this transparently without any modifications in uh, the other service. Right? Axon Server will transparently route all messages between these uh, these services. And even when we scale applications, still uh, based on certain uh, certain assumptions, there's uh, without hardly any configuration. And we'll see later on uh, uh, what kind of configuration you do have. But without any configuration, uh, it will transparently uh, communicate all, um, uh, send all messages uh, to uh, to their uh, their destination. Now, for in microservices messaging, there's there's different types of messages, and the the one that is most known is the event. Right? Uh, the the event driven microservices is a very common theme nowadays. And events follow a very typical pattern. They're pub sub, which gives them great advantages. Um, and if you've seen multiple webinars of ours, you will you will know that this is uh, this is not the first time that I'm uh, I'm saying this. But events don't have a result, and an event is a is a notification that something relevant has happened in the domain. Right, something happened somewhere that might be relevant for other applications, but the sender doesn't care about the recipient and and what it does with that message. It doesn't even care whether there are any recipients, right? So there's no results to these events. The downside is that because it's PubSub, it's not, and it doesn't have this feedback cycle, it is not usable to be the only type of message in uh, in an application. And I've, I've seen implementations of event-driven microservices where that was the case, and there's a lot of accidental complexity in those situations, because sometimes you, you have a clearly different intent with your message. That's why we also uh, identify commands and queries in in our message, uh, in our messaging patterns, where commands are messages that express an intent to change the system state, so to trigger some sort of a side effect. And queries are a request for information. Uh, a component needs specific information to make a decision or to to show to a, uh, to an end user or to export to some other system, etc. Now, commands follow a typical pattern where a single command is routed to a single component that can actually handle that command, and it may provide a result. Typically, it's, it's some sort of acknowledgement that the command was successfully executed. It may provide some information about uh, the, the actual execution result. Some simple values are typically uh, uh, returned as a result of a command. In queries, however, there's different routing patterns. Um, queries might be routed to a single destination, sometimes multiple, and we'll dive into that uh, in, in more detail a bit later. And always a query will return a result. In the end, the reason for sending the query is to get that result. The result is the part of the communication that holds the value, uh, whereas in commands, it's the actual side effect that's generated that is the value of the, uh, of the command. Um, and to make it more clear, there's a very clear distinction between an event and a message. So when I talk about messages, they are either commands, events, or queries, or their results. Um, 
and when I talk about an event, I clearly mean an event. So a notification that something relevant has happened within the application uh, that is uh, published to any component that is listening to those, uh, those events. Uh, so I prefer the term message-driven microservices rather than event-driven microservices. Uh, because the events uh, should not be the only messaging building block in uh, in an architecture, and what this this separation of the of, of this this style of messaging gives us is location transparency. It is the uh, the fact that application components do not know or do not care about the destination uh, or, or the actual destination of their messages. Uh, so they just send a message and they expect that message to be routed to a destination that can handle their, that message for them. Uh, because they are commands or events or queries, we can, um, we can find a component that has declared the ability to, uh, to respond to that query um, without the sender needing to know where that actual component is. Is that component uh, together with another component inside the same uh, application or are they uh, deployed completely separately, that doesn't matter anymore. And that gives us the ability to start with a structured monolith here depicted on the left, migrate to some situa situation where specific components are extracted from that monolith and later on uh, more components are extracted. There's a lot of advantages to monoliths, um, mainly because uh, they are, do not have to deal with the problems of distributed systems. Uh, they are a lot easier to refactor, but then monoliths have their disadvantages uh, where uh, they become harder to maintain with larger uh, teams, for example. It is uh, sometimes it may be harder to scale than smaller components, um, etc. So there's a lot of reasons why you would want to extract services. Uh, but it is very valuable to be able to delay that moment to the moment where you actually have more benefits than uh, uh, drawbacks from it. So if we look at the, uh, the infrastructure diagram of before, what I really want to focus on in this webinar is the messaging part of Axon Server. So in the previous webinar, uh, we focused on the uh, event store, which is the blue component uh, right below. Right now, we are focusing on the messaging part, uh, the, the part dealing with the commands, the events, and the queries, and, and routing them to their destination. And we're going to see how that works, uh, first from a, from a conceptual level, and then diving into some, uh, some of the technical details within Axon Server. Now, you could um, have a look at the uh, types of messaging systems out there, and you can put them on a scale on how intelligent these systems are in respect of their understanding of the messages that they transport. And if we look at the, um, the systems that are very knowledgeable, um, the system that is most knowledgeable about the type of messages, we, uh, we typically have the enterprise service bus. Uh, it's a very powerful system and it really understands all the messages that it sends. It can inspect the payload, it can even make decisions based on the payload and do transformations and it's very, very powerful, um, but it also has its drawbacks. Um, the opposite of it is our typical message queues like, uh, like RabbitMQ or uh, AM, AMQP-based uh, systems. They, um, they don't know, they don't understand the message at all. For, for them, a message is a black box. They just put it in a queue and whoever takes it out of the queue uh, now owns that message and, and good luck with it. It doesn't do uh, complex routing at all. Uh, some systems can do a little bit of routing based on some, uh, some, some routing keys that you provide. But basically, that is about choosing a queue in which they need to put uh, a, a message. We feel that there's a very big middle ground where a lot of value uh, can be uh, um, achieved uh, without the um, added complexity of an ESB. Um, within the ESB itself or the added complexity in the applications to work with message queues. And that is where, where Axon Server uh, uh, was designed to be. Um, it does understand the stereotypes of messages. It might understand some of the metadata that is provided, but it uses the routing patterns based on those stereotypes, um, and, but doesn't look into the payload at all. So all it needs to know is, is it a command, is it a query, or is it an event? And in that case, 
we know what uh, you expect uh, to be done with that specific message. And it's an application's res responsibility to ensure that the format of the payload is correct. Um, so if you send a, a query of a certain type and the uh, recipient expects a certain payload for that type of query, then it's your own responsibility to make sure that both the sender and the receiver have the same expectations. Axon Server does not interfere in any way with the payload of messages. As I said, the routing patterns for commands, events, and queries are, are, are somewhat different. Um, so let's have a look at how that works with, uh, within Axon Server. So imagine we've got two applications, uh, in this case A and B, and Axon Server is responsible for routing the events between, uh, between the two. Now, if application B, uh, when it starts, and typically that would be an Axon-based uh, application with, with Axon Framework inside of it, uh, it doesn't strictly have to be, we'll see that later, but application B to retrieve events, to read events, it will open a stream. And when it opens an event stream, it will pass on the, um, the token, in this case, it's an index, but it's a token describing the last event it has received. And that is information that Axon Server uses to find the next event for that application. In this case, um, if, if it received uh, number three, it has received all events because there's only events zero to three in, um, in Axon Server. So it doesn't receive anything. The, the stream is opened, but it doesn't provide any data at this point. Now, if as soon as application A emits an, a, a, an event, that event will receive sequence number four in this case. Um, it will be appended to the, uh, the log and pushed right away to application B because application B has this stream open. It indicated that uh, three was the last message received. So Axon Server knows, okay, then you must receive number four as the next, uh, next message. Now application A has uh, broken down its connection because it doesn't care about any results. As soon as application A has posted the, the event to Axon Server, its work is done. All it cares about is that the event is actually stored in Axon Server and made available for consumers to, uh, to read it. Now, when a new application comes along and says, I want to open a stream, it might uh, say, in this case, uh, the last event I received was number one. It will receive events number two, three, and four immediately because they are ready for consumption by that, uh, that application. Right. So every application that reads events will receive its own copy of, uh, of the events. Right. So the fact that one application has read an event does not interfere with any other application. Um, that might, might sound very logical, uh, but if you do this in a typical message broker, you have to be really careful to not have these applications read from the same queue, because as soon as a message is taken off of the queue, that message will not be provided to anyone, to any other application uh, uh, reading from that queue. Um, so to summarize, um, when you publish events, events are stored inside the event store of, of Axon Server. Um, it follows a pub-sub messaging pattern. That means that every message will be published to all the consumers um, that are interested in, in that message. And there is a form of guarantee delivery where we use the token. So every message is accompanied with a token and the consumer can store that token uh, locally or in its, in its own database so that when the connection is broken or the application shuts down and restarts, it can retrieve that last token and send that to server and say, server, this is where, this is the token I got uh, from your last message. Please give me all the events that have been uh, appended since. Um, and the sharding of, so in, in case you have multiple instances of an application and you want to make sure that every event is handled by one instance of, a, uh, of, of uh, that application, um, the sharding is based on, the, uh, on clients. We use um, uh, tracking tokens for that. Uh, there's a blog on our website about exactly how the, uh, the tracking processors work. And this is also uh, useful for multi-threaded processing uh, so it doesn't really matter whether you have four threads all in the same application instance, or if you have two application instances with two threads each, 
or uh, one thread each in four uh, different instances, that really does not matter. You will have a guarantee that exactly uh, that uh, every event will be handled by exactly one instance of, uh, of your application. And um, as of uh, Axon 4.2, uh, we also uh, support event blacklisting, which is also driven by the client. So as soon as the client receives a message that it does not understand, it will send a notification to Axon server to uh, please not send that message again. Um, and that allows for, uh, for massive I.O. optimization in case uh, consumers of an event stream are only interested in a small portion of, uh, of the events of, uh, in the entire event stream. All this information is ephemeral. So that means if uh, a connection is closed and reopened, the blacklist is also gone and has to be rebuilt. Uh, this is a safeguard to ensure that when you do an upgrade of an application, um, where you do want to listen to new events that you don't have to tweak anything to make sure it works. So it's just an optimization that at runtime, it will start blacklisting events where it knows this, uh, this type of message is definitely not handled by uh, this, uh, the consumer of this specific stream. So, so far for, for events, um, uh, the, the other webinar about the, uh, the Axon Server event store also uh, uh, goes into more detail of, uh, of events and how uh, consuming these events works. Now, commands are slightly different. So when, um, when an application uh, starts and an application is capable of handling specific types of commands, it will notify Axon Server, start a, a connection with it and, and notify it that it can handle specific types of commands. In this example, uh, application B can handle commands of type A, B, and C. Now, when application A sends a command, in this case, a command of type A, which is uh, for which application B is a handler, um, well, that command, that's, it's easy. That's routed to, uh, to application instance B, right? and that command may provide a result or may not, doesn't really matter. Things get slightly more complicated when there's also an application C that declares the ability to handle commands of type A and B. Um, now, commands have a single destination. So in this case, when application A sends a command, it has to be either sent to, to application B or application C, but definitely not both. So how does um, Axon Server make a choice of, uh, of the destination? And to do that, it keeps a little internal routing table. So it keeps track of which nodes are currently connected that are capable of handling which types of commands. So when command A comes in, it will uh, uh, know when to choose application B and when to choose application C. And it does that based on a routing key. And the basic rule is if the routing key for two commands is identical, they will have the same destination. Um, internally, we use the concept of uh, consistent hashing to, uh, to find their destination. And consistent hashing is a very nice algorithm to make sure that when a new application uh, joins an existing uh, uh, group of applications to handle a specific command, then uh, there will be minimal interference of um, the, the new application, the commands that the new application will handle compared to the other ones. Um, if you were to use a simple modulo operation, um, you do modulo two in this case, because there's two destinations. Um, if you do a third one and you do modulo three, now suddenly everything shifts, right? All the destinations will, will change. Consistent, uh, consistent hashing is an algorithm where um, not everything will change. Only um, a portion of B and a portion of C will be transferred to a new application when it joins. Uh, so that the, the interference is minimal. So how do you get that routing key into that, uh, that command message? Uh, well, if you use Axon Framework, you probably already put uh, an at target aggregate identifier or maybe at routing key on, uh, on your uh, command messages that the, the value of the field that you have annotated there is automatically transported as a routing key metadata property uh, inside the uh, the commands that are sent to Axon Server. So in that case, Axon Server knows exactly uh, where to uh, to route messages. Um, 
So because commands are routed to a single destination and, and may return some form of results, um, the um, um, nodes, the, when they start, they report their, uh, their capabilities to uh, two Axon servers. So again, when a node disappears, Axon server knows nothing about that node. All information it has is ephemeral, so it just knows about the current state and the capabilities of whichever applications are currently connected uh, to the application. Um, and it uses this consistent hashing to make sure that all commands are routing to, routed to a single destination. Um, and, uh, and that's basically, basically it. So the last type of message that we have are queries. And this is uh, yet slightly more interesting uh, than, uh, than commands. Uh, so imagine, and again, you know, this, is, uh, this is a pattern that we've seen twice before now. When an application connects, it reports its capabilities to Axon Server. And in this case, it will also report the types of queries that it can handle. Queries are identified by uh, actually two properties. It's the type of query, usually defined by a name of, of the query, uh, but also the return type. There's a specific type of message that is returned as a result of that query. So uh, a, a, a query name could be find all. Well, find all doesn't specify much about what type of query it is. So in this case, it, uh, the name of the query is find all, but the return type is a customer or uh, an order or whatever uh, information that you're trying to uh, to find. Um, so when application A sends a query of type Q, in this case, uh, Q question mark, um, Axon server knows it needs to reroute it to application B and uh, application B is then able to provide a response to that query. But things are slightly different when there's a yet another application. So if there's application C that can handle uh, uh, queries of type Q and R. Now, if the message Q is sent, how do we know where to route that message? And the problem is Axon Server doesn't really know automatically. Uh, you need to provide uh, at least some information about how you want to send that query. Um, and that is actually very easy to do. There's different uh, APIs on the query bus that you can use. There's basically three types of uh, queries that we support. Now you can do a plain query. You can just ask a question. Uh, and this is a very useful pattern if there is a single authoritative answer to your question. In other words, um, you just have a question and there's one answer. Right? There's one true answer and you want it. In this case, the query is routed to a single destination. Um, it does not use a routing key. Um, it, um, it depends on which version of or which edition of Axon Server you use. In the Enterprise Edition, um, routing uh, is based on the performance uh, characteristics of applications. So the faster applications are more likely to receive a query than the slower applications. Uh, and it, it maintains metrics uh, um, uh, over time so that it knows uh, which, um, which application is probably best to, to receive that specific query. So in this case, that might have been application Q. Application Q then provides a, a result, and that result is sent back to application A. So now application A has its answer to its, uh, to its query. But there's another option. You can also do a scatter-gather query, and um, this is where things get interesting. So a scatter-gather query is a type of query where you ask more of an opinion of different nodes and different nodes might give their view on a specific state of, um, of, of the answer, right, of the query results. So in this case, a copy of that query is sent to every application. Um, if there's multiple instances of an application, again, Axon Server will choose a single instance of that application, but it will send a copy of the query to each application. And each application will provide a response. Right. It will provide its view on the state of whatever is asked for. And both these responses are sent to application A. Application A now has the possibility to, um, to uh, apply a reduction function to uh, all these different uh, queries to decide which one does it take or does it uh, combine the two answers, maybe to, uh, take an average or maybe list them into a single uh, list response or 
whatever it is that you want to uh, uh, to do with that answer. Maybe you want to pick the first answer and ignore the rest, right? Um, so there's different patterns uh, that you can use, different um, um, solutions that you can um, um, provide using this scatter gather uh, query. Now, unlike uh, a query in a scatter gather query, it's very important to uh, set a deadline for the scatter gather because there might be a lot of different destinations and you don't want to indefinitely wait. Now, Axon Server is smart enough to know that all potential applications have provided their answer. So it will provide a signal to application A that it should not wait for any responses anymore. So if you use Axon Server to, to send these scatter gather queries, uh, you hardly ever hit the deadline. Axon Server will know uh, all um, um, potential answers have been provided, so you don't need to wait any longer, and application A will continue immediately. Um, do keep in mind that application A is completely unaware of how many destinations are currently available to, to answer this query, right? So this, uh, this information is only known to, uh, to Axon Server. And there's a third, uh, third pattern that you can use, which is called the subscription query. So you can start a subscription to a subscription query. And again, it involves a certain question. But in this case, the question is again, routed to a single destination. That single destination may provide an answer. That answer is sent to application A. But when that answer is provided, the connection stays open. And that is because in the subscription queries, you can get updates on the results of the query as the information changes. So if the answer changes um, uh, later on by some external factor, maybe an event arrives in application B and it updates some, some information, or maybe it's just a, a type of uh, a stock tick application where every second it sends an update, um, Application B can decide to send a delta or an update message. And then that update message is also transported to A. So as long as A has a subscription open, it can receive updates of, uh, of the query in um, practically in real time, um, um, updating the, uh, the, the model that it has been copying. Now, notice that this is slightly different than events, right? If application B was to send an event, then uh, that event would be published to application A and, and C as well, or at least made available for A and C to consume. In this case, the delta is only provided to the components that have an active subscription for that update. And another major difference between the two is the language being used. So events generally describe the domain language. Uh, they describe um, a, a fact that happened and a, a, a conceptual delta, uh, so to say, whereas the delta of a query uh, describes the exact change to the model that uh, is used to, uh, to, to provide the results of the query, right? So application A doesn't have to understand all the events that led to this change. It just needs to understand how that model is built and then um, either gets an update. In some cases, you would want to send uh, just the new view altogether. In that case, application A doesn't need to learn, quote unquote, uh, different kinds of languages to, uh, uh, to update its state. So to summarize, uh, queries have different routing patterns. We can use the point to point, which is just the plain query. You can use the scatter gather queries, which are more a publish, subscribe, uh, kind of pattern. Um, and there's a subscription query, which is routed to a single destination, which can then send updates to the response as uh, the response uh, changes to that, uh, to that question. Uh, again, here, uh, applications report their capabilities to Axon Server. So Axon Server doesn't need to maintain anything uh, persistent. As soon as an application connects, it provides its, uh, its abilities. And as soon as an application disappears, Axon Server will completely forget about the cap capabilities of that uh, application so that when it comes back, it will rebuild its state. Uh, and when it doesn't come back, it's just uh, gone. So there's no uh, advanced configuration required. Uh, the routing strategy, as I said, is uh, mainly performance-based. 
uh, in the uh, standalone edition of Axon Server, the, the open source version, it is essentially round robin. Uh, so um, every, um, every query is, is passed to a different destination. So how does that work internally? Uh, diving a bit into, uh, into more detail, um, all transports from client to server, as well as between Axon Server instances, in case you have a cluster, is based on gRPC. GRPC is effectively protobuf over HTTP2, um, and it's it's very uh, it's a I think it's a very elegant protocol. Um, all communication is initiated by application components, so Axon Server does not need to know anything about um, the the the, uh, the applications itself. Applications will start; they know about Axon Server and start this communication. And this is possible because gRPC is a very uh, efficient two-way communication. Um, so it's very easy for um, an application to connect and then Axon Server can push messages to, uh, to the client as long as the client is open to, to receiving any of these, uh, these messages. That means we don't need any uh, complex discovery uh, mechanisms to, uh, to detect applications. We can just use these, uh, these connections. And as soon as a connection breaks, an application will automatically reestablish uh, a connection. It's, it's very fast. It just takes a, a mere few milliseconds to, uh, to reestablish a connection. Um, and another big benefit is the proto files. They are public. Um, so you can generate stubs, uh, client stubs, using uh, uh, gRPC uh, uh, generators uh, to generate any uh, clients for non-Axon and even non-Java applications. Uh, some of our clients have uh, built their own stubs in, uh, in Go, or uh, you could even use them in JavaScript if you have some Node.js applications. Um, it's very simple and, and they're very uh, simple to, uh, to use as well. So how does interaction work from an application perspective? How does an application, what do you see as an application developer uh, when using Axon uh, uh, Server. Now imagine you have an Axon Framework application, uh, you'll have some command handlers, and these command handlers um, may use the command bus, right? Um, they, they just use the interface, the, the interface of a command bus. Um, they don't see, you don't actually see the implementation of the command bus. In many cases, you don't even see the interface, but um, all that the application does is it registers the handlers with that specific implementation of the command bus that you happen to have. If you have a single um, um, instance of a monolith, then you might be interested in just using the simple command bus. It is a local implementation. It doesn't use any complex um, uh, remote invocations. It doesn't have any threading. Uh, it's a very simple, as the name suggests, implementation. The only thing you really need to do is take that out and replace that with an Axon Server command bus, just a different implementation. That Axon Server command bus will communicate with Axon Server. It knows exactly uh, how to establish a connection, and when there is a connection, it will automatically notify Axon Server of all the commands, that, uh, handlers, all the types of commands that this application can actually handle. And it knows that because all the handlers have been registered with the command bus uh, on, uh, on startup by, by the framework. So there's nothing yet you need to do. Um, if you use the Axon Spring Boot starter, this all happens automatically. Um, even if you don't use Spring Boot, uh, if you use the configuration API and you have the Axon Server client uh, dependency in your um, um, in your uh, in your application, uh, it will automatically set up a connection with Axon Server, uh, provided that you have told it where Axon Server is. Uh, it will assume it's running on localhost, which is very nice for uh, for developer machines. In production, you probably want to have a slightly different setup. Uh, so that's the only thing that you really need to configure. Um, it's just a location of, uh, of at least one of uh, the Axon Server nodes uh, that you have running. So how does that work when you're um, you're doing this at scale, right? It is very uh, it's zero configuration. You can just start up application and they communicate transparently. That's all really nice, but how does that work at scale? And there's different types of scale that we need to uh, to address here. 
And one of the uh, types is the number of components. So what if you have a large number of components all communicating through Axon server instances? What will that look like? Uh, well, the title, I guess, says it all. Uh, you have to be, uh, be very careful. Uh, it might turn into an unmanageable mess. And it's not for technical reasons that this will re uh, result in a mess, but in um, mainly messaging and uh, conceptual messaging um, uh, reasons. So imagine everything communicates through a single cluster of Axon server. Um, the, the problem here is that these applications might have different language they use, right? So this might be a, a module that is responsible for shipping orders to, uh, to their destination, and it wants to know when an order is placed. So it would ideally receive an event to notify there's, a, uh, there's an order, and hopefully it, that event will contain enough information for that shipping module to know what needs to be shipped where. The problem is that the application responsible for providing orders, it, it is responsible for managing orders. So it has a lot of detailed uh, events um, about things that have changed in that order. And it might not use the term order placed. An order placed might not be uh, an event where all that information is passed, right? Uh, the, uh, in this case, you have an, a separate event for a shipping address that was attached to an order because it happens, everything happens in different steps. And an order is confirmed. Well, an order confirmed event probably only notify, only has the order identifier and maybe a, a little bit of extra information just to say the order was confirmed. So these components clearly speak a different language. In domain-driven uh, design terms, that is a, a bounded context. Um, and everywhere where you have communication, you have to be aware that there's a contract. In some cases, it is an explicit contract. In many cases, it's an implicit contract. But you cannot deny uh, having a contract between these, these two applications. One application sends a message, another one receives it. As soon as you change the shape of that message, you might break your consumer. Uh, so in that case, you always have a certain expectation. Um, and that's why uh, there's this uh, sort of marriage symbol. There's, uh, uh, there's always expectations that you have. And especially with events, it's pretty dangerous because as soon as you emit an event and the scope of the, uh, of the consumers are anywhere in your organization, um, you basically have a marriage with an unlimited number of uh, significant others, but you don't know which ones. That might become messy. Uh, well, it will become messy very soon. So that's why we want to embrace this concept of a bounded context, where typically uh, organizations are already organized around these bounded contexts by um, departments, right? People that speak the same language tend to sit together. Um, if they share responsibilities, they probably share an office space as well, uh, but also in language, right? They speak the same language. There's a certain term has a very specific meaning to that group of people. And that same term might have a different uh, meaning to, uh, uh, to another department. So we recommend uh, to share, well, everything, quote unquote, all the detailed events, they're very useful or, and usable within components that are in the same context. Context. So if you emit an event, you emit an event within a context, like within the sales context or within a shipping context. And it will make a lot of sense to other components within that same context. But when you communicate in between contexts, you want to be more conscious. You want to not provide all the little details, but probably provide less events, uh, maybe less queries as well and the results might be slightly different, more useful to, uh, to a global uh, audience uh, in, uh, in, in this example. So in this case, when uh, an application emits all these detailed events and another application wants to know only the, what we sometimes call milestone events, right? An order placed, you could say, well, that's a big milestone in, in, uh, in, in the process of an order then you probably want to get a component uh, on uh, um, a separate component that translates messages from within a bounded context to some more public language. 
And how does that work in Axon Server? If you consider a cluster of five nodes, what you can do in Axon Server is create contexts. So it is literally called a context. You can create a context and you can choose on how many servers you want to install that context. So in this case, five, that means that messages are, are replicated five times. Events are replicated five times when they're stored. Um, but it also means that applications can connect to any of these five nodes and communicate with each other transparently. And a context B might be installed on three different nodes uh, because it doesn't need to be as replicated. There's maybe not as many clients connected to that context. Um, and an application that emits a message to context A will not reach a destination for applications connected to context B. They are separate. Um, as of Axon 4.2, it's also very easy for applications to connect to more than one context. So it's very easy to say that um, an application is responsible for reading um, uh, events from context A, doing a bit of language translation, and then posting the result to context B so that it becomes relevant for that context as well. So that this, um, uh, the, the corruption of what happens outside of your context does not leak into, uh, into your context, making sure that even uh, at scale, your architecture has uh, very same uh, boundaries. Now, every uh, application uh, will connect to that uh, to a single context. Uh, there is access control, so you can define which applications are allowed to uh, connect to which uh, context, right? So you don't accidentally or on purpose connect to a context where an application is not authorized to, uh, to communicate. Um, that access control is done using tokens. Uh, so a token is, is effectively username, password in one. Uh, it is also uh, a large portion of the token is encrypted uh, on the server or, or hashed uh, so that um, really the token is unrecoverable if you, if you lose it, right? So be, be very careful. Um, if you uh, try to connect application B to, uh, to context A, it will reject that because application B is only configured to be allowed to uh, to read from or to connect to context B. If we were to remove uh, the authorizations of, con uh, for, of application A to connect to context A, then also that token will be invalidated for that uh, for the communication with that context. And in that case, application A is not able to connect anymore at all because right now it doesn't have any rights. So you have very fine-grained access control. You can decide whether it can read from context A, can it write, can it post commands, can it uh, post command handlers or register command handlers to that context. Uh, there's a lot of settings that you can define uh, that allow applications to connect or, or not. Uh, obviously, when an application disconnects, this information is maintained, right? So Axon uh, Server doesn't actually know which applications are connected. It just knows which tokens uh, are authorized to do what. So it's your own responsibility to make sure that the tokens are provided to the correct applications. Now, there's another aspect of scale uh, that we have addressed in, in Axon Server, and that is more of the geographic scale. Uh, we have seen situations where applications are deployed to multiple data centers um, or even in uh, multiple geographies. And, and for the uh, sake of argument, I'm going to exaggerate this example a bit uh, and uh, do a multi-data uh, center setup across the globe. So imagine we have a cluster of three Axon servers and every Axon server instance is in a different geography. Uh, so one is in the US, one is in the Netherlands and one is in Singapore. Um, so these all happen to be um, um, uh, locations where uh, Google has data centers. Um, so this is also a scenario that we have, uh, we have tested. And imagine you have different applications deployed in different geographies. Again, the US, the Netherlands, and Singapore, but now there's also one in Denmark. Right? Application C is deployed in, uh, in Denmark. Um, so it is pretty obvious that what you want is for every application to connect to the closest Axon server instance so that messaging, at least between the application and server, is very efficient. Um, but this is where Murphy comes in. Um, up to uh, uh, Axon Server 4.1, an application would connect to an instance just to ask 
what application, what what instance should I open a, a a connection with? And it might say, well, keep this connection, it's fine. And it might say, no, you need to connect to an Axon server instance somewhere else, uh, because Axon server tries to balance the number of connection across the uh, across the cluster. Um, so unfortunately, Murphy's law will uh, result in uh, in probably a connection like this. Now. If application B was to send a message to ap application C, conceptually, it would have to travel a distance of 10,000 kilometers or 6,500 miles. Um, you can imagine that it has a bit of latency. Right? Uh, unfortunately, because the uh, connections are not done in the most efficient way, it will travel uh, first from application B to the middle uh, as actual server instance, which basically is also that destination. Uh, sorry, that distance, so it travels 10,000 kilometers, um, but that application, that actual server instance is not connected to C. Um, the cluster knows that the first instance is connected to C, so it will forward the message, in this case, to the US across the Atlantic for another 9,000 miles, assuming it's on the West Coast. Um, so now Axon Server in the US has received that message and it can transport it to application C, which is yet another 9,000 miles away. So right now, uh, sorry, 9,000 kilometers away. So right now we have traveled 28,000 kilometers uh, to get a message from D to C. Um, that is a huge waste of kilometers. It's, uh, it's fine if, uh, if, your, uh, if your messages have uh, an air miles account, uh, but otherwise, uh, it's just a waste of, of basically all, uh, all of the resources that you, uh, you have. So what have we done to make sure that this, uh, this will not happen? And that is um, uh, tags. So in, uh, in Axon uh, 4.2, we support the concept of tags. Um, you can attach tags to your applications. Uh, in this case, because it's a geographically uh, distributed system, uh, these tags would have to define the location of these applications. Uh, so they could provide a continent and a country, for example. Um, and we do the same in the Axon server instances. Um, and right now, when, um, when an application connects to an Axon server instance, again, it will ask, which instance should I connect to? And these instances are now aware of each other's tags and Axon server will uh, provide the application with the destination with the most matching tags. So for the US and the Dutch and the uh, Singapore instances, that is pretty simple, right? There's a full match on the tags. Uh, they will connect to their local instance and it's not a problem. Now for the Danish one, there is no instance uh, of Axon server with the exact same uh, number of matching tags. And what it will do is find the instance that has the most matching tags. In this case, there's one match on the continent tag. Uh, so it will choose the, uh, the only other instance on that same continent. And this is obviously also what we, uh, we want. Now, in, uh, in practice, you will not probably not have um, uh, this much of a geographic scale, um, but there's already a lot of benefit in, in using this, uh, even when you use availability zones and regions, because very uh, uh, typically within uh, cloud providers, communication within the same availability zone is free, whereas communication between components in different uh, regions, uh, um, well, it's not expensive, but at least is a, is a paid for uh, service. So you probably want to keep latency and cost down as much as you uh, as you can, and and minimize the uh, cross regional uh, communication. So how do you configure Axon Server and how do you tune it? Um, as I said, there's a lot of zero configuration uh, to to get it working. So if you just start an instance and start using it. Uh, all you need to really configure is the uh, destination of at least one of the nodes of Axon Server for, uh, for your own applications to connect with. That's the only must in the configuration. But then there's a lot of tuning you can do. Uh, there's some uh, static configuration, so some instance-specific configuration that is done through property files. Uh, we, um, uh, Axon Server is a Spring Boot application itself, so you can use uh, property files or YAML files uh, as you uh, as you wish, um, and there's a lot of things you can uh, you can set up. But some of the more important uh, things are uh, the the location where you want to store 
uh, the events and there's a little control database that Axon server also uses to store the um, uh, the, the tokens um, and uh, authorizations of applications. Uh, you probably want to enable SSL and access control. Uh, access control is the uh, mechanism that uses the tokens to uh, uh, to set up application uh, to for applications to connect. You probably want to enable all of that. Um, but only after properly configuring uh, a token that you can use uh, yourself to configure um, Axon Server, uh, for example, the cluster. And the last, uh, you can have the, the tags. You can provide all sorts of tags. Uh, basically, it's, uh, it's key value pairs uh, that you can use and you're free to use any key you, uh, you like. Now, there's also a lot of runtime configuration. So uh, creating the tokens uh, and authorizations of applications and uh, uh, the, the load balancing of event processors. And there's a lot of things you can tune. And for everything, we support a CLI. So there's a, uh, a CLI, an executable jar that allows you to, uh, to get metrics in this, uh, in this case from, from Axon Server. Uh, but also to do, uh, to register nodes to a cluster or to create context, everything uh, has a CLI. There's also an HTTP API, uh, so you can uh, um, you can use curl or whatever mechanism you'd like to uh, to send uh, HTTP requests to that destination. Um, and if you're UI minded, you can just go to the UI and click on on buttons as you please. Uh, everything is uh, is doable through all of these. Um, uh, different uh, methods. So if you're eager to get started, how do you get started? Well, you can, uh, Axon Framework and Axon Server are both uh, available on GitHub. Um, and Axon Server is uh, downloadable through uh, the Maven Central repository, uh, either using Maven or Gradle, doesn't matter. And for Axon Server, you can get a, a, a Docker instance from Docker. You can download a zip from our zip file. Uh, and if you're uh, if you want to get Axon Server Enterprise, that's where there's a little bit of communication with our guys. We can set you up with a trial license if you uh, if you send us uh, an uh, an email. So just go to axonic.io uh, slash download. Um, there is a uh, getting started uh, zip that you can use that contains everything that you need to get started, uh, including a sample application and a little guide that uh, that gets you on the road within uh, within a mere uh, couple of minutes. 